Hi, I thought we'd take a look at space or room heating. If you've got a heater in a room like this, how do you effectively heat up the temperature of this room or heat objects like people or other things inside the room and do it effectively and efficiently? Let's take a look at it because there's lots of scams and ridiculous bullshit marketing around in terms of like space heaters and other kickstarters and lots of things that claim to be more efficient. So let's go through the basic theory of how to heat a room up and the different types of uh, heat transfer that you actually get in a room. Let's go because it's rather interesting and it, it's probably more to it than you think. Now we first have to look at the three different types of heat transfer and because these terms, this terminology gets mixed up a lot and I'm guilty of it myself uh, just through sheer laziness or not uh, explaining it properly and marketing of course, um, <laughs> they get these things completely wrong all the time as well. So let's start with conduction. If you've got a material like this and it's hot at one end and cold at the other the heat will transfer or conduct through the particular medium. And I've done a whole video on the concept of heat sinks, for example, which I'll link in at the end, which is uh, very interesting in terms of electronics engineering. Now, conduction depends upon the thermal resistance of the material that you're conducting through. And it doesn't have to be a physical material like metal. Metal happens to be, or various types of metal, happen to be the best conductors. But you can also get heat conduction through uh, gases and liquids as well. They're just not as effective. But some different types of gases, much better than others others, some different types of fluids, much better than others, some different types of metals, much better than others. And of course you can have like uh, metals like joined together and if this one's hot and this one's cold it can flow from one to the other. But it's basically it conducts through a medium, whether that's metal, liquid or gas. This is basically the second law of thermodynamics here because hot atoms are going to vibrate. They have a lot of energy and they're naturally going to tend to move towards or spread out towards the less energetic uh, areas over there. So that's why you're going to get heat conduction. It's basically the second law of thermodynamics, you know, the heat death of the universe, all that sort of stuff. Energy just tends to dissipate and spread out eventually. It's pretty miserable. Now the second type of heat transfer is convection and you might be familiar with that term. A convection microwave oven for example uh, has a fan in there to force the air and circulate it around. The air convects around inside the space and a similar sort of thing can happen in a room when you try and heat it up. If you've got a space heater for example that uh, uses convection, then of course you're familiar no doubt with that hot air rises. That's why balloons go up and everything else. So the hot air rises like this and then it like it comes around the room if the room is well insulated and we'll go into this and you get natural convection going around like that. And there's two different types. There's natural and forced. As I said, a natural one doesn't use any fan at all. And you might be familiar with these uh, oil heaters or some other type of heater, heaters that don't have any fans in them. They've got these big fins on them and they basically, they heat up an oil inside, but they've got these large surface areas that the air circulating in the room goes over the fins. It rises up like this and then it naturally comes down and it sort of heats up the room rather slowly by natural convection. There's no fan forced uh, type system, but you can also get the, you know, the box type ones. They have a big like fan in them like this, and then they have some heater elements on them and they actually force the air out to help it circulate around the room. And they can be more effective, <laughs> not efficient. They can be more effective in heating a room faster, for example, because uh, they force the air around the room rather than just relying on natural convection. And this is why if you stand near one of these oil radiators that have no fans in them, you have to get reasonably close to them to sort of like feel any heat. They're designed to heat up a volume of a room quite slowly through natural convection. And once again, convection needs a medium through which uh, the heat can transfer, in this particular case, air inside a room. So both convection and conduction, because they need a medium to transfer the heat through, they do not work in a vacuum, i.e. they don't work in outer space. So the sun, for example, which is the heat source for this planet, can't 
use conduction or convection. There's no medium for it to transfer through. So you can think of convection working where you have a surface that's hot, like a surface element, like a panel radiator, for example, that sits on your wall and it has a large surface that heats up or these fins that heat up, for example, and then the air circulates past those fins and convects. It's a sort of like a transfer from a surface onto a uh, medium, another medium, typically air, of course, that circulates over that and it just draws the heat away by the process of convection. Now to infrared radiation, as I said at the start, this doesn't need a medium to transfer through. So all of the heat energy coming from the sun is in terms of uh, radiation. In this case, infrared radiation, and this is just like any other type of electromagnetic spectrum radiation. In fact, if you look at your electromagnetic spectrum, you'll find that part of it is the infrared radiation, i.e. heat. But then uh, that is broken down into many different types, and we're going to be a bit loosey-goosey with the uh, wavelengths here, for example. These are wavelengths in micrometers for uh, five different types types of typical IR spectrum you might hear near infrared which are, is used for night vision goggles that, so that's a frequency range generally up to about a thousand nanometers or one micrometer uh, wavelength and then you've got short wavelength infrared radiation mid long and then far infrared so you might hear these terms and they're different like depending on which standard you follow like the ISO standard for example um, uses the term near mid and far for example it doesn't have short and long so don't really fuss over the exact categories but basically all this sort of stuff in the middle here is what's called thermal radiation and don't confuse that with infrared radiation because it's a specific wavelength which can be dependent upon the temperature of the uh, in this case for heaters the heating element for example you might be familiar if you heat your soldering iron up enough it may be at 500 degrees C you'll start to see it glow like a dull red and then it might go into uh, you know orange and then yellow and, and then white at say you know 1500 degrees C or thereabouts so that's why say your bar radiator heaters and here's a photo of one of those you're more familiar with they just have the bars with typically with a reflector at the back because that will reflect the radiation off the back of that and towards you so these are actually directed radiation heaters so they will heat the object or a surface at a distance via radiation not via conduction not via convection but pure electromagnetic radiation from the source into the object that you're heating and by the way, the energy goes up with a fourth power of the temperature. That's Stefan Boltzmann's law. Won't go into the details. So in terms of commercial infrared IR heaters that you can uh, buy, they're typically like a panel mount. You mount them on the wall, uh, for example, and you might get these in your bathroom. And for those who don't like the visible glow of, which can, uh, can be quite hard on your eyes, of a bar radiator heater, you can get like ceramic radiator heaters and other types. You can get new graphene based ones, which are infrared radiators. So they're designed to heat the object directly. So if you've got your panel radiator here, it goes across the room and it'll heat up poor little human on the other side while not actually heating up the air in between. That's the theory anyway. Now this is where we have to get into actually practical space or room heating with heaters that you can buy and they come in two types, either the convection type or the radiation type. You don't really get conduction heaters because air is a pretty, pretty poor conductor. But in practice, it doesn't matter what type of heater that you buy, whether it's a convection heater or a radiation heater, an infrared heater, they're all gonna have some small but non-trivial amount of conducted heat through the air. Air is certainly a poor conductor, but it doesn't have an infinitely high thermal resistance. So you do get some conducted heat through the air. And any infrared panel heater, even no matter how well it's designed, is also going to uh, do convection as well. Because you've got this big panel, this big surface area, you're going to get the you know <laughs> convection currents. You just can't avoid it. So it's going to heat the room via both 
uh, direct infrared radiation and via convection and some conduction as well. And likewise, if you've got a pure uh, convection heater like one of those oil radiators or one of those fan forced little space heaters, with the element and the fan to circulate through the air, they're also gonna produce some infrared radiation as well. So it really depends upon how the product is actually designed, whether or not it's predominantly IR radiation or whether it's predominantly convention. But every type of heater is gonna have at least a combination of these things. So these infrared or radiation heaters come in several types. They might be, as I said, the panels that you stick on the wall which you can't see any visible glow from, but they still actually produce infrared radiation which actually goes across the room and heats the object over here directly. And these are really useful if you're outside, for example, if you're sitting on your table at, uh, you know, you're having dinner here, for example, and then you might have one of these uh, infrared heat lamps which will, you know, go down and they will heat uh, the people directly like that. And any uh, convection losses are just sort of, you know, lost out into the free air. So, you know, really you want those to be as well designed infrared radiators as possible. You're gonna lose some to convection, for example, and some uh, conduction to the metal and things like that, which then is gonna have its own little you know, convection ones going off the surface and things like that. But mostly it's going to be infrared radiation, it might be 70 or 80 percent or even a little bit higher, direct of the power that you put into it, it heating up the actual objects, which might be great if you're outside at a table, for example, having dinner late at night and it's really cold, you, you know, you like that heater. But inside a house, these aren't necessarily the best thing because you might feel like you're getting, you know, baked by this infrared heater. And of course, if you walk from here over to here in the other part of the room and the infrared is going in that direction, then, well, you're going to feel woo, really cold in this part of the room and not here. So that's not necessarily good for a large living environment like this. It's okay if you sit in a lounge and then the heater's on the wall in front of you, it might feel pretty good, but it's not going to be great if you want to live inside a, you know, a relatively large, uh, like a house or a lounge room or something like that. And that's why these different type of heaters are available. You might have one of these oil heaters, for example, which is going to uh, convect around like this and eventually heat up and keep the room at a certain temperature. And you might combine that with say an IR panel heater if you're just sitting on a lounge and you just want to be heated up directly. So this is uh, going to be faster much faster and more effective than uh, turning on a, a radiator that's either going to use natural or force convection. As I said, force convection will be faster, but natural radiation might take hours to lift the temperature of this room. But you've got to be careful with how you use and apply different types of heaters. Let's say you have an infrared radiator heater and it might be 80% you know, or, or more infrared uh, radiation. Well, that's great. But if you have, say, a glass window over here, that could shoot straight out of the window because the glass is typically going to be fairly transparent to the infrared radiation. But that depends on the wavelength and also this thermal radiation that you get with a thermal imaging camera. I can demonstrate that now, how thermal radiation doesn't get glass through glass at all, but infrared radiation at a specific wavelength will actually pass fairly transparently through a window. So you don't want to be pointing that at a window. You're just going to lose most of your heat directly out the window. So I've got my Fleur E8 thermal imaging camera here, and this is designed to detect thermal radiation. And you're no doubt familiar with these things. They're very cool. And let's have a look to see what glass actually does. So I've got my glass cubicle here like this. As you can see, if I'm in front of it, like there's my thermal imaging profile. It's detecting the heat coming from me. And these types of cameras will work up to, you know, quite high temperatures, many, many hundreds of degrees, as well as like body temperature as well. But if I go behind the glass, oops, where's my hand? It ain't there. Where's my body? Half of it's gone. Check it out. Isn't that cool? And if I put my hands right up to it, you still can't see anything at all because the wavelength, the particular wavelength of thermal radiation uh, that we're seeing here with this camera simply cannot get through glass. But I've done a video on this as well. It'll go perfectly fine through plastic. Don't try this at home, kiddies. There you go. You should still be able to see me, <laughs> even though my head's behind this plastic. 
works fine through plastic at this wavelength, but the particular wavelengths we're talking about here just can't penetrate glass. So that's why you can actually use glass on uh, these infrared panels because they're the correct wavelength to go through. It's, it's almost transparent to that particular wavelength. And maybe, just maybe, if I left my hand there long enough, it might eventually conduct through. But as I said, glass is a poor thermal conductor. But if I put my hand on front like that, you might be able to, maybe you can see my handprints. Cool, huh? And let's say if you had one of these newfangled glass infrared heaters, for example, that doesn't have a reflector on the back of it, it's got glass, it's got the heating element inside, which is generating infrared, uh, direct infrared radiation, but it can come out both sides, it's got glass on both sides. Then if you go and hang this on the wall, for example, oops, half your infrared energy is going to go that way and half's going to go into your wall over here it's going to heat up the wall. Yeah, just be careful how you mount these things. Now here comes the tricky business. Let's say you put a thousand watts into uh, an infrared panel heater that emit emitted both sides. Let's assume in that there's no convection at all. It's not true, but let's just assume 500 watts going in this direction, but you might have 500 watts going in the other direction as well. Let's assume it's a symmetrical uh, design. So that 500 watts is going in to heating up the wall and the wall is going to conduct because it's a physical medium. It's going to actually conduct the heat out and then you'll get convection on the outside, which will then take it off the surface. You remember convection is designed to take heat from a surface into an air medium. So yeah, if you see one of these uh, glass infrared panel heaters that have glass on both sides and no reflective surface on one side, and you see them hanging on a wall, eh, just have a bit of a giggle because you're wasting a lot of power. But in theory, let's say you had a perfectly insulated wall, there was no conduction out of there, then you're basically heating up that wall with the 500 watts and then that wall will have convective air currents which will take that off. So really in terms of heating up or raising the temperature of your room, that heat is effectively going to stay inside your room assuming there's no conduction out. But of course, in practice, you're going to have heat conduction losses out your walls. So you've got to be careful with actually comparing the effectiveness of uh, one type of heater to another. If you've got one of these infrared heaters, it's great at heating up you and you go turn it on, you go, oh, that feels nice and warm. How fantastic is this? It's only drawing a hundred watts and oh, a couple of hundred watts. I feel fantastic, but it's not raising the temperature of your room. If anything, in fact, your room could be cooling down due to losses, which we now have to go into. And one other thing you've got to be careful of is when you're measuring the performance of heaters like this in a room, let's say you had your thermometer here like this and you know, you're getting a reading on your thermometer, be careful that that's not heating up the thermometer. That thermometer may not actually represent the temperature of the room. You really have to put them in the dead spots like this in multiple points to you know really get a feel for how much the room temperature has actually risen. So these IR heaters, just be careful with them. And here's where the terminology gets mixed up a lot. These oil radiators are actually called radiators. They, as in like, but if you want to go strictly by the terminology, radiation only refers to infrared radiation, electromagnetic radiation that heats a source directly, but it's common industry terminology to call these radiators. So the terminology is quite muddled up, but you've got to realize that they're actually really majority convection heaters and not IR, they're certainly not majority IR radiation heaters. Now here comes the crux of this video really. How do you raise the temperature of a room or a space. Now it comes down to an old school unit called BTUs or British Thermal Units. But you don't have to use BTUs because BTUs are directly equivalent to watts, i.e. electrical power. So if you put say a thousand watts into an electric heater inside a room, if it's drawing a thousand watts, you're going to generate X amount of BTUs. 
Now, watts is actually an amount of energy per second. It includes a time component. One watt is actually equal to one joule per second. It's got that time component in it. Likewise, BTUs have a time component as well. So uh, you can just directly convert from BTUs to watts, or watts to BTUs. One watt is approximately 3.4 BTUs per hour because it has that time component. And you can work in terms of joules, you can work in terms of watts, or you can work in terms of BTUs or British Thermal Units. They're all equivalent. You can convert one from the other, but it's basically heat over time. Now, as I mentioned in a previous video, if you've got a heater in the room, doesn't matter what type of heater. If it's, say, a thousand watt heater, by definition, any electric heater i.e. it uses an element to heat up, is 100% efficient. Remember, efficient is different from effectiveness. IR heaters might be more effective at heating up a person directly, but in terms of heating up the temperature of a room, all that matters is the power, i.e. the watts or the BTUs. So any form of heater, it doesn't matter if it's a thousand watts of direct infrared, it doesn't matter if it's a thousand watts uh, convective, if it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't matter what it is. If you're putting, if you've got inside a sealed room and you're generating a thousand watts and also consuming a thousand watts from the mains because they're always, almost practically by definition, a hundred percent efficient. So if you see any manufacturer out there claim that their uh, heater whether it's infrared type, doesn't matter whether it uses magic woo-woo graphene in it or whatever the whiz-bang bullshit marketing technology is in there, if it's generating a thousand watts, it's exactly the same as any other 1000 watt heater. And you can't get around this. This is basic thermodynamics. To heat a volumetric space, you need X amount of BTUs. In this case, like BTUs includes that hour component. You have to put that energy into the room in order to heat it up. Now, let's assume that we have any sort of heater, doesn't matter what type it is, it's inside this room, it's generating a thousand BTUs per hour, which is equivalent to roughly 293 watts. So if you bought a 293 watt IR panel heater that you hang on your wall, it's generating a thousand BTUs an hour into this room. But of course, rooms aren't perfectly insulated. You're gonna have losses uh, through like gaps in your wall. You're gonna have windows over here. You're gonna get some losses out of there because glass is, well, it's a fairly poor uh, thermal, con has poor thermal conductivity. It's, it, you know, you can actually lose a lot of energy out your windows, which is why we have double glazed windows, for example, and, uh, and double brick wall construction. They'll have like an air gap in the walls and they're better thermally insulated. A house that's built that way, better thermally insulated than one that just has a single brick construction. It's called double brick construction and double glazing windows because they'll have that air gap because air is, although glass is still pretty poor, air is even poorer. So air is a better insulator. So that's why you uh, take these measures when you're building an energy efficient house. You wanna try and keep the heat in there, but it doesn't matter what you do. You're gonna get losses, conducted losses through um, a top roof, which is why you'll have your, uh, you know, your insulated pink bats for example, um, you'll put those, you know, those wool insulation bats in your reeling to stop that uh, heat being conducted and then convected out through your roof. And that's why you'll have these little, you know, whirly bird, uh, well, call them whirly birds here in Australia, you stick them on your roof and they vent the hot air because you've got the radiation coming in from the sun. It's going to heat up this roof. And if you're trying to cool it, but that's a cooling thing. Anyway, you can actually lose heat uh, via your roof as well as putting heat into the room as well. But yeah, you want to avoid conducting out uh, that and then convecting out of your roof. You want to avoid conducting out your windows and your walls and your slab. You know, if you've just got a wooden floorboard, for example, it's going to be worse than a big concrete slab. And so you've got all these losses. But let's assume that all of our losses added up everywhere totals a thousand BTUs per hour. And it's actually quite difficult to actually uh, model and measure all of these losses, which is why we have like just lots of rules of thumb and other uh, industry things, which we'll go into. But let's say your total losses, you can measure it at a thousand BTUs an hour. 
if you're putting a thousand BTUs an hour into your heater, or your heater's generating a thousand BTUs an hour, that's what you're pulling from the mains, and it's heating up this room, then your losses equal the amount generated, so you will not, <laughs> by definition, basic laws of thermodynamics, you will not be able to raise the temperature of this room. Yeah, if, if you're here, for example, right next to it, you might be able, you know, you, you're going to feel warmer, but the entire temperature of the living space will not rise, not a single degree, because your, your generation equals your losses. And when discussing this sort of thing, the question always comes up, well, what if uh, a lot of my energy is light? or vibration. For example, if you've got the U-beam transmitter that's transmitting a thousand kilowatts of ultrasonic energy from one side of the room to the other, well, that thousand watts has to go somewhere. It's being generated inside that room, so it's got to heat up the air molecules, it might heat up the, uh, the person who's standing in front of it, or whatever it is, might heat up the walls or whatever. And likewise, if you've got one of those infrared panel heaters, if they're facing a wall, for example, it's going to heat up the wall. But the point is, it doesn't matter what type of radiation it is, light, sound, vibration. You might say, for example, that one of those uh, fan, uh, forced fan convection heaters, for example, well, you've got to use power for the fan. Therefore, it's not 100% efficient. It might be 99 or 95 or whatever, because you've got to waste energy to the fan. But <laughs> the, the, that extra power that goes in the power of the fan, it's going to be lost in bearing friction, for example, winding resistance, all sorts of stuff. It doesn't matter they're still 100% efficient. The energy eventually gets converted into heat. Doesn't matter what it is. So don't let anyone say that any form of heater is not 100% efficient, because it ultimately will be. You've got 1,000 BTUs an hour into that space. And likewise, if your losses are 1,000 BTUs an hour, and you're not generating 1,000 BTUs an hour, because you've only got a pissant 200 watt heater, for example, this room is eventually going to cool down. The temperature is going to drop until it reaches some sort of uh, equilibrium, but it's certainly not going to stay the same. You cannot beat the laws of physics, Captain. So just remember, no amount of woo-woo, graphene, or other technology whiz-bang marketing that claims uh, some heater is more efficient it is 100% demonstrable bullshit. It's all about BTUs per hour. And there's basic uh, calculators online, and they do vary uh, quite a lot, but they try to uh, estimate the amount of losses, like they might have, you know, low, high, or, mo or normal type uh, losses in a room. And to work out how much uh, energy you need, how many BTUs an hour, or what wattage heater that you need to heat up a room, let's say we have a 15 square meter room, five meters by three meters by 2.5, you use one of these many uh, calculators available, and let's say you wanted to increase the temperature of this room by 10 degrees Celsius, then, well, you put that into the calculator and you need 4,200 BTUs an hour or roughly 1,250 watt heater inside that room will eventually do it. But like I said, there's lots of practical aspects into this. Like if you have your heater over in this corner of the room over here and you happen to have it near lots of losses, around this part of the room, then you're going to have a harder time rising, uh, increasing the temperature on this side of the room, uh, for example. So, you know, it, there's really a lot of variability in here, but the basic fundamental thermodynamics are the same. You need to increase that by 10 degrees C, you might need 1250 watts, and that could vary if you had really good insulation, you might only need, say, 750 watts, or you could need like two and a half thousand watts, depending upon that thing. But if you buy like a little 200 watt panel, for example, and expect it to increase the temperature of a 15 square meter room by 10 degrees Celsius, uh uh. So, in basic heat transfer theory, the heat always moves towards the colder object. So if you've got, you know, a really lots of losses over on this side of the room, you might have a door open, for example, then you're going to get lots of uh, transfer of the heat, or lots of convection over to sort of this cold part of the room. You're going to get lots of losses over there. So yes, while certain different types of heaters, either a, a direct infrared radiation heater, they can feel it's all about the feels versus reels. They can feel more effective, but they aren't really necessarily going to increase the temperature of the room unless they've got X number of BTUs an hour to overcome 
the losses in the room. There's just no way around it. But hey, if you get like a little, you know, a couple of hundred watt heater, infrared heater, and you sit right near it, in front of it, you've got a radio or a bar radiator heater, for example, you sit in front of it, you're going to feel toasty warm, even too warm. But that's not going to help you much if you get off and walk around the room and all that sort of stuff. You want a comfortable living space. But in terms of heating up a, a space heating, a room heating, it's X number of BTUs versus the losses. And you need more BTUs input than you have in losses. It's just a fundamental aspect of thermodynamics. And just be aware that there is no such thing as a more efficient heater, uh, like a space heater. It doesn't matter what the marketing bullshit claims, doesn't matter what woo-woo material they use inside the thing, it's useless. It's all electric heaters, regardless of their type, are 100% efficient, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Yeah, generally, if you want to heat up a space, get one with a fan-based uh, forced convection system. That's going to heat up a larger volume of air in a room quicker than any IR radiator or any just uh, one of those uh, naturally convection oil heaters. And don't let any bullshit marketing also tell you that things can magically generate heat when there's no electrical input. You have to put in electrical power to get heat output. Now, in uh, the oil radiators, for example, they're actually a quite a good thermal heat sink because the element, the resistive element in there heats up the oil and they actually stay hot for a long time. But when you pull the plug, yeah, they'll still feel like they're, uh, you know, they still will be convecting heat out, but that's only because they're a heat buffer. It's, you don't magically continue to get more energy out. When you look at the whole energy equation for heating up the room, so any claim about any woo-woo technology that can magically generate heat during an off cycle or when the power's off, nah, it's just a heat buffer. When the equations are all said and done, and at the end of the day, you haven't generated any more, you haven't input any more energy into your room. Now, by definition, even though the different types of heaters, they're all 100% efficient, some heaters can be more efficient than others. But <laughs> we do need to be very careful with how we say this. Let's say that you have a heater on this side of the room and all you care about is heating your definition of efficiency. This is where the definitions matter. Or is heating this part of the room over here by say 10 degrees Celsius. Then that's where an infrared heater, for example, that heats up that spot directly might be more efficient in terms of the overall system in heating up that particular spot than say a, conve a slow uh, convection, natural convection heater over this side of the room. It's gonna take much longer and hence require more BTUs and more power, more electrical energy to heat up that spot by a given temperature than another type of say infrared heater would for example. So you've got to be very careful how you specify this. It's in terms of a total system efficiency. And I, I, I'm really hesitant to use the term, but I think we need to explain that technically it's possible, but that does not give a license to the manufacturers to claim on, the, on their marketing material on the box that their heater is more efficient than any other type of heater. They're all 100% efficient in terms of converting electrical energy into heat. So they have no way of knowing what the end use configuration is. So there's no way that they can say it's 800 times more efficient, it's eight times more efficient, it uses one eighth the power, it uses half the power of a competing unit. That's bullshit because they don't know the end system configuration. So if you see that claim on any type of heating product, you know it's bullshit. And be careful of any company that uses, say, watts per hour, for example. You know they have no clue what they're talking about. It's just watts because it's joules per second. It already has a time component, so you can't go watts per hour, which then would be an accelerated time thing. Yeah, the bullshit just keeps accelerating. So all electrical heaters, 100% efficient, 
That's it. End of story. The only way you can get greater than 100% efficiency on an individual heater, like the actual heating unit, is when you use what's called a heat pump. And this is how air conditioners work. They aren't just generating the heat inside the room. They're actually pumping it um, like outside the system. So the, the system efficiency or the coefficient of performance or COP, it's called, can be greater than one. So air conditioners can technically have an efficiency greater than 100% without beating the laws of physics, but what that actually means, so let's say you have a one kilowatt air conditioner, for example, you know, it's got the unit on the outside, remember that, it's actually outside, then it can actually generate more BTUs per hour than the equivalent electrical energy input. So uh, th that's why it's, it's not beating the laws of physics or anything like that, it's just because it's working as a heat pump, and they are a real thing, that's how air cons work, but that's story for another video. But anyone else who claims that anything's more than efficient than any other type in terms of using electrical heaters, you know they're full of crap. So there you go, I hope you found that useful. This was actually a lot longer than I was expecting, but it did waffle on a bit. But anyway, there's a lot of stuff which goes into this, but the basics, BTUs in, BTUs out in losses. That's what it comes down to pretty much. But yeah, some different types of heaters can feel more effective than others, but at the end of the day, Depends on your particular circumstances, but as always, you cannot beat the laws of physics, Captain. Energy in versus losses. That's all it comes down to. So I hope you found that useful. If you did, please give it a big thumb. One thumb up is fine, because that's all you can do. And as always, comment down below or on the EEV blog forum. Catch you next time.